Okay, in this video, we're gonna be doing Calc BC problem set number 40. Problems and a playlist are in the description below. Uh, let's take a look. So number one, we wanna evaluate the integral of five x plus two over four x squared plus 12 x plus 13. I look at that and I immediately think, I don't think that denominator factors. So I'm gonna definitely try to um, complete the square. I mean, I might initially try to do u substitution, but I can see that like the, the du would be eight x plus 12 and that does not line up well with five x plus two. So instead, I'm gonna to try to complete the square. Uh, I'm gonna rewrite this thing, take four out of uh, the x squared and the x term. So we have four and then quantity x squared plus three x, and then 13 just on the side. Uh, to complete the square, we take the coefficient of x, which is three, divide by two, that's three halves, square it, that's nine fourths. We're gonna add and subtract nine fourths. The first three things are your perfect square. So we're gonna have four, the quantity x plus three halves squared, then what we need to do is distribute the four to the negative nine fourths to get negative nine plus 13 is four. So this is what we have. There's obviously a four that you can take out of both of those. So I'm gonna do that. So I will have, and remember it's in the denominator. So I'll have one fourth because I took out that four. We got five X plus two. And then I'm rewriting it as one plus the quantity because I'm thinking arctan is involved. And I always like arctan to look like one over one plus U squared, ideally which we're working our way toward. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a u substitution. I'm gonna say u is x plus three halves. So when in doubt, when you're working toward arctan, if you're not sure what to do, let u equal uh, u basically, right? One over one plus u squared. Let u equal the thing that you're squaring. Um, and you can usually work out a substitution and the problem usually kind of drops out. Okay, if u is equal to x plus three halves, then x is gonna be u minus three halves and then dx will just be du. Okay, let's make all of our substitutions. So we're still gonna have a one fourth. We're gonna have the integral of five times um, x, right? But x is u minus three halves, so replace that. Plus two is still there. One plus now u squared, and dx becomes du. So here, what we wanna do is clean up the numerator a little bit. We still have one fourth. We're gonna have um, five u, and then minus 15 halves plus four halves, so minus 11 halves, all over uh, one plus u squared, and we got our du. This, we're gonna break up into two separate integrals. So each of them is gonna have a one fourth in front of it. I'm gonna factor out the uh, negative 11 halves here so that I'm like getting, I'm looking for arctan. Like it looks like we're gonna get a bonus natural log here, um, but I was thinking from, from the get go that this would be an arctan. So for the first integral, I'm gonna take out five. So I'll have five over four. And then the integral of u over one plus u squared, that actually is natural log. There should be a two in the numerator, so a one half outside. So one half natural log, absolute value, one plus u squared. This next part, we have negative 11 eighths. And then that is a perfect arctan, right? So that's just arctan of u and plus c. So we're effectively done. We just gotta figure out what this one plus u squared thing is and make sure we replace all of our u's. I'm gonna go with this like in the easy way, I think. Um, ordinarily, I'll try to like trace through here uh, and, and get like one plus u squared into something really nice. But I'm just looking through here. It's like, uh, there's one plus u squared, came from here, came from here. I think that's a plenty good stopping point. So I'm just gonna use one plus the quantity x plus three halves squared. So what I could have done is I've just looked at what I made u equal and plugged it in because that's essentially what I ended up doing. So minus 11 eighths, arctan of u, and then plus c. And that's our answer to number one. All right, good problem. Let's take a look at the next one. So this one's calculator um, and it's like a little complicated. So I actually decided that I would just record the calculator part and I'll put it in. We're gonna make use of symmetry on this, right? So I look at this picture, it says, find the area of the shaded region shown above enclosed by the loops of the polar curve r equals two plus three sine of three theta, which is not a famous polar curve. I mean, it's probably famous, but it's definitely not like top tier famous. So um, I'm gonna switch over to the calculator. My game plan is there's like three regions. Uh, I'm just gonna find one of them, one of the shaded areas, and then multiply by three. So I'm gonna switch over to the calculator uh, you can follow along with that, and I will be back to uh, write some stuff by hand. So, see you then. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to try to do is graph this thing. I'm going to graph it in polar mode, 
but as we know, we're going to do most of the work in function mode, but um, let's just get a sense of what this looks like. So it's going to be menu three and then option five for polar two plus three sine of three and then theta is in the pi key. So theta, I'm going to press enter. It's going to graph it from zero to two pi, which you can see is, is the entire thing. Um, now the issue is what I'm going to do to try to use symmetry is I'm just going to find if I can the area of like this big loop right here, um, which you can see is going to start before theta equals zero because theta equals zero would put us on the positive x axis. We're going to be like a little to quote unquote the left of that because um, we have to rewind a little bit. And then we'll go until the first time for a positive theta that r is equal to zero. That's that's my plan for that. And then the little one is just going to be a dip below the axis of the rectangular graph. So we're really looking at like one big loop kind of of the rectangular graph or a hill, let's say, instead of loop, and then one small. And then I'm going to find the area of both of those, subtract them. That should give me the shaded area, which will be kind of like this part. And then I'm going to multiply that by three. So that's, that's my game plan. So I'm going to switch over to function graphing. I'm going to insert a page, so doc4, and then insert a graph page. Function is what I want. I'm going to use the var key. Uh, R1 of in function mode, you graph with x. So we have this. So you can see each of these, uh, like look at the x-axis. When you're above the x-axis, that's a big loop or a big pedal. Um, and when you're below, that's one of the small pedals. So all I need to do, well, all, uh, I'm going to uh, zoom box, I think, uh, and just try to get like a picture of like one and one. So let's say this, like ideally I wouldn't have extra zeros in the picture. Okay, here. All right, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna add zero. I'm gonna do menu eight, one, four, click this, click this. All right, so we got three intersections, three zeros. So what we wanna do, let's move this is we're gonna integrate from uh, here to here, right? That'll be the big pedal. And then if we go from here to here, that'll be the smaller pedal. Subtract the areas uh, and then multiply by three. That That's my plan. So I'm gonna store these as A, B, and C. So that's control menu, option five, A, uh, control menu, option five, B, and control menu, option five, C. So we have A, B, and C. I'm gonna put in a calculator page, doc four, and then option three. So we're gonna do, the entire curve is just R1, right? So I don't have to really think about that. It's one half and then the integral, so shift plus. We wanna go from A to B. You can just type A and B or you can use the, the var key. A to B, and then I'm gonna use the var key to get R1 of um, t, I like to use t instead of theta, it's just easier to get to, squared dt. So that's gonna be uh, the area of a big pedal. And we could just like get that, or we could do it all in one shot, it, it doesn't really make a difference. Um, and then I'm just gonna arrow up, grab this, change this to b and c, and uh, there, that's the smaller one. So the difference between them is like one of the three shaded regions that I want to add up. So it'll multiply by three. And I get 25.822. All right, so I'm gonna go back to, uh, we're gonna go back to the handwritten stuff, write this up, uh, I will see you there. Okay, so uh, what we did was we found where r equals zero by graphing. So that gave us these values, which I stored as a, b, and c. Then we set up our integral um, we did three of them, right? We did one region and then tripled it. Uh, there's always a one half when you're doing polar. And then uh, what I'm gonna do, I did the integral from A to B of R squared D theta minus the integral from B to C of R squared D theta. And our approximate answer, 25.822. That's a good polar problem. Uh, you might run into that. I mean, it's certainly conceivable. In my experience, they stick to the more standard things or things that don't really have overlapping regions, but you never know. Um, certainly in class, you could see that. All right, let's take a look at the next problem. Which of the following series converge? All right, so uh, I don't know how much work I'm going to do on these. I'm just going to determine if they converge. Uh, I'm going to do more work than I would. Like multiple choice, I would just write down the answers. Here, 
uh, I'm gonna think it through, right? So sine of 3n is not always positive, it's not always negative, this isn't really strictly alternating, but I do know that the absolute value of the sine of anything uh, is less than or equal to one, which means that the absolute value of sine of 3n over n to the fifth is less than or equal to one over n to the fifth. That's good because one over n to the fifth converges. If that's the case, then we know that this series where we have the absolute value converges absolutely, right? Basically by the direct comparison test. Um, and once we know this converges absolutely, we know that when it's not absolute value, it also definitely converges. So this series converges, good stuff. Let's take a look at the next one. Uh, we have e squared over 27. That's a constant to the n. This is just geometric. So we just have to figure out if e squared over 27 is bigger than or less than one. E squared, I mean, e is less than three, so e squared is less than nine, so e squared is definitely less than 27, which would mean that e squared over 27 is less than one. If that's the case, we converge. So I'm gonna say this converges, and my reasoning, it's geometric. All right, if I look at part C, this looks to me like basically a P-series where things have gone horribly wrong, right? So the numerator should have just been n squared. The denominator should have just been n to the seven halves. And people mess around with it, and that's how you end up with weird looking things. If we simplify this, we get one over n to the three halves. We know that one over n to the three halves converges. So we could say that this converges by limit comparison, which is basically where I would stop the work on that. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Okay, number four, calculator. R is the region bounded by the line tangent to e to the x at x equals zero, and the function f of x, shown above. Find the volume of the solid formed when R is rotated about the x axis. All right, so fortunately it's calculator. Calculator doesn't play that great with um, the summation, so we have to rewrite this as a common function, but we definitely know that this is geometric. So f of x is going to be the first term, which is one, over one minus the ratio, which is x over three. We could simplify that, but we're just gonna use a calculator anyway. Um, so the next thing we need, I'm gonna define e to the x as just g of x so that I can talk about it more easily. So g of x is e to the x. G of zero is therefore e to the zero, which is one. G prime is e to the x. So g prime of zero is also one. So we can write our tangent line and we'll have like the two things that we need to work with. So that's gonna be, uh, usually I write y minus one equals one quantity x minus zero, but here I'm just writing y equals one plus x because it's just easier to use. Also, the first degree Taylor polynomial, which you have memorized, is the tangent line. So you actually knew that it was one plus x without doing that work. All right, we need to figure out where these things are equal to each other. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just pop up a uh, calculator page, show you what that looks like, uh, and then I will handwrite it. So you can see that we get intersections at zero and two. Here's what my work would look like for that. So one over one minus x over three uh, is equal to one plus x. And our calculator tells us that happens at zero and two. Evidently, we could have done this by hand. I don't know, I definitely don't wanna do that. So those are our intersection points. Let's write down the integral that we're gonna use and then I'll pop up another calculator page. So we have the volume, there's gonna be a pi there, so it's pi. The integral from start to stop, so zero to two. We do have to know which curve is on top, but it's definitely the linear function, which is one plus x. So we're gonna go the quantity, one plus x squared, that gives us a big volume, minus the quantity, this thing that we did not simplify, one over one minus x over three squared dx. Here's a calculator page of what I typed in. It looks exactly basically like what I wrote, except I have the functions defined on the calculator and we get our answer is eight pi over three. All right, this is actually the last of these problem sets because uh, I don't know, I'm tired. Uh, so I hope these were all very helpful to you and uh, good luck.